There really is a huge variety that can occur in an amethyst. Different mineral specimens, geode, faceted gems. This piece is actually an anhydro. It moves. Cool. Hey everyone, Rebecca and Brittany here. We've got another gemologist versus geologist episode today and we can't wait to see what's in these boxes. Two boxes mm. today. So one clue, two boxes. One of the most famous colored gems, but the oddities of its natural form may surprise you. Ooh, so pretty. Right. Oh, that one's awesome. These are obviously all amethysts. So amethyst, of course, is the purple variety of quartz. So you can see all of these purples, which range from really light lilac to a deeper, more royal purple. It gets its color from iron impurities, but not just that. It also requires heating and irradiation. Potentially gamma radiation from the host rock or other types of gamma radiation. All of these specimens are different, but they all have similarities as well. So quartz is in the trigonal crystal system, and what happens is you will typically have hexagonal prisms with a pyramidal termination at the top. You have it here, and you loosely have it in these. However, these have a really fun element to them. These are called scepters. As you can see, there is a series of concurrent larger growths towards the top of the crystal. So typically with sceptered minerals, in most cases quartz and specifically amethyst, initially there are other crystals growing around this amethyst, typically calcite. In the initial phase, it's kind of like a smaller area of growth and at some point the calcite around it kind of like erodes away just a little bit so it kind of gives a bigger opening. And then some outside source usually comes in with like more solution in it so it allows the quartz crystal to kind of grow more parallel to the first generation crystal. More space that allowed the second growth to kind of like grow bigger. So this is a typical normal scepter where the first generation growth is smaller than the second generation growth. What we also have on the table is this reverse scepter to where the first generational growth is bigger than the second generational growth. A similar kind of story as to how reverse scepters work. Somehow in more of a abrupt nature, the solution just, I guess, maybe evaporates or like escapes elsewhere. So it just kind of like becomes a lot smaller. So reverse scepters are actually a lot more rare, even though yeah. scepters in general are rare, but reverse scepters are even more rare. And this one's interesting because you can see at the termination, it has that deeper concentration of purple. So while there was less space, there was a higher concentration of the iron electrons or of some sort of irradiation that occurred at the end there. Mm -hmm. So that's really cool. Yeah. Again, like they tell these fun growth stories. This is a fun one. This has a whole story to it. Mm -hmm. This is from Thunder Bay in Canada, which is a famous deposit for amethyst. But there are two elements that make this really interesting. You can see the red coloration caused by hematite. Hematite is a really popular inclusion. There's in some in these two pieces as well, more so just as like occasional inclusions. Yeah, they often do produce this hint of red in amethyst. The hematite here has covered this size and caused it to be red. Thunder Bay is actually known for having this red hematite coating on their amethyst. Another interesting element of this piece are the triangular growth marks that you can see particularly on this face here. These triangular growth marks are unofficially called record keepers. What happens with these triangular growth marks is they didn't have enough space to complete their journey as a crystal face. So you can see remnants of their growth. It mimics the shape and the size of this larger face. So a very interesting story there. Yeah, most growth marks will typically resemble like what their internal crystal lint structure is, which is, I think, really neat. So there is a particularly neat feature with this piece, and it's within this particular amethyst prism. This piece is actually an anhydro. So anhydro, meaning water trapped inside, so you can see a bubble of water. Yeah. 
Cool. If you tilt it back and forth, you might be able to see I that I see that bubble. right there. Yeah, which is honestly like some of my favorite kind of inclusions because it moves. That's super cool. And again, the hematite is really cool on that as well. Yeah, it's really, really neat. Sometimes the way how light interacts with the crystal, sometimes it looks like it has phantom inclusions in it, almost kind of like a skeletal structure within them. The Amphis Quartz is known for some of that zoning and some of the phantom crystals that you can see. You can see that there is internal color zoning that mimics the growth of the external structure. So it's as if there's a crystal inside, but really it's just zoning of a different color. But still really, really neat. You ready for our next boxes? I'm ready. That's awesome. Let's see what's inside. All right. Oh, that is too cool. Oh, spiky. Ooh, that one's spiky. awesome. We have one more, which is not in a box, mm -hmm. but it is really cool looking. Kind of looks like Michigan. It does. All the crystals are going in all sorts of different directions. So many. So let's talk about how amethyst forms. It's silicon dioxide. So you have silicon and oxygen and then any other impurities. We can see in a lot of these amethyst pieces where the base of the quartz is kind of like more colorless and then as it has grown more, more or less becomes more purple. And that kind of coincides with just the general formation of amethyst. You find a lot of amethyst in quartz crystals in basalt and basalt is kind of one of those deeper rocks that you'll find. It's usually like really, really dark and it has like a lot of mafic minerals and elements that are more radioactive is kind of what causes the irradiation and heating to cause the purple color. Of course, the amethyst has to have iron in it in order for it to react. And why we typically see more of that purple color like towards the termination in most cases Quartz is growing in like a hydrothermal environment, which involves a lot of solution with a lot of chemicals in it. And in this case, if you imagine a cup of water and you like drip just maybe like a dot or two of food coloring in that water, but you don't stir it, a lot of the water at that base, you can imagine, is kind of like your colorless quartz crystal. And so it's going to draw from that solution at that point. But as you know, the water goes down in that cup, it's gonna be more saturated with color. And so kind of like just as it grows, it's usually just gonna have more saturation of that purple color. And so we're seeing the concentration of iron change over time. Typically, you're gonna see a higher color concentration towards the termination. Of course, you can also have more uniform colors throughout, but this is a great example of color concentration actually more towards the base and it getting more colorless as you reach the terminations. And so there really is a huge variety that can occur. It's such a fun mineral to collect because you can have all sorts of aesthetics when it comes to your pieces. I really like the, the reverse color nation because it's not something you typically see. I do too, I think it's really, really nice. So all three of these specimens are from Mexico, but this crystal is from the Four Peaks Mine in Arizona, and it's currently the only commercially run amethyst mine in the United States. It's thought that some of the amethyst in the Spanish crown jewels came from this deposit. There's a lot of amethyst here. And I think it's time for another box. I'm gonna try to be a little careful here with everything that's on the table. You ready? Yeah. Ooh. Ooh. These are faceted pieces of amethyst. One is an ametrine, which we can talk about. These are obviously quite large. So amethyst quartz can come in really large carat weights. And as you can see, they're relatively clear as well. So it's a type one clarity stone. This also is a great example of the range in color. So here you can see it's quite light. This really beautiful lilac color has a trade name Rose de France, and it alludes to this light, nice pastel purple. And then of course this one is a nice deep rich purple, kind of that royal 
color that we all know and love. This one's kind of a nice mix of both of them. It's a nice medium color, and it's actually called a Ferris wheel cut. And as you can see, it resembles a Ferris wheel. And then this one is Ametrine. It's from Bolivia. So Ametrine is a mix of amethyst and citrine. Of course, both are types of quartz. Citrine and amethyst can actually be treated to turn into each other. So irradiated citrine can become amethyst. Heat treated amethyst can become citrine. And you can always get a combination of the two. I see we've got some very nice slices over here. These are actually really cool looking because of some of their color concentrations. Sometimes the color will just concentrate in specific faces of the crystal. And what we're seeing is a cross section of that, which is really neat. So if we look down the C axis of the slice, which to you guys would be kind of like that direction, you see kind of like these alternating light to dark triangular color zonings. It's very kind of like trapeche like in emeralds that you'll see. You won't typically see something as clear in an amethyst quartz crystal with these alternating color zones because there's a lot to look at in a whole crystal but if you take like a slice of it you're able to see these triangular growth color zoning a lot easier i think is really really cool yeah these slices are awesome and actually you can purchase the slices and the sphere and the jewelry so we'll put the links in the description below if you want to check those out so amethyst has been around for quite some time it is known to be used in ancient egypt and ancient greek and actually it was equated with gems like emerald and ruby until a massive deposit was found in Brazil. Because of the abundance, then the rarity obviously changed and the perceived value changed. So it's an example of how the market changes, time changes, we value different gemstones in different periods of history. So amethyst is a durable gemstone, but from a stability perspective, it's not the highest on the list. It is somewhat sensitive to direct sunlight, so you don't wanna have your amethyst out in direct sunlight or even in, like in a window from a display perspective because it can fade over time. Now it is possible to get that purple color back but it just has to you know be irradiated back to do so and I don't know of any local places that will just irradiate stuff for you so I don't have one at home I think we have one more box and less table space <laughs> that works just right there okay. Oh, okay. Ooh. Oh, all right. you can have those two so I'll take the others so these are geodes these are nice and polished. Yours is still rough. So these are from Mexico, right? Yes, these geodes are actually from Les Choyas in Mexico. So a very popular place for many geodes. Both of these have this nice blue agate and then a nice amethyst interior, but yours has some pretty interesting minerals in there as well. Yeah, the red that is actually in this particular geode is manganese and that kind of like brownish to like very lustrous crystal that is in this side is gertide, but it's not encased in the Druzy quartz that's in this geode, but it's encased in calcite, which is pretty interesting because you think it'd be the Druzy quartz that's also just lining the rest of the geode, but nope, it's calcite. Very cool. Surprise. That's why geodes are so fun. You never know what's inside. So another place that is famous for its amethyst cathedrals is Rio do Sul in Brazil, a very famous locality. There's so much amethyst here and they can grow to massive sizes, some so big that you can stand inside of them. And so this occurred from basically a massive lava discharge 125 million years ago. So there's a lot of opportunity for geologic formations and this is actually quite heavy so I'm gonna put it down but this is again called an amethyst cathedral so we haven't obviously cracked this open yet we will one day we promise but you can see that it's encased in this cement which is intended to preserve the geode you can see 
There's a little tiny hole in there. So if you take a flashlight and shine it inside, you can see lots of little amethyst crystals. Well, I do see a lot of amethyst in there and a lot of maybe dust. All right, Brittany, time for a closer look. There's a lot to choose from, Rebecca. There's a lot to choose from, but I have to say that my pick is going to be this scepter. The color is awesome. Mm -hmm. The scepter growth is obviously very interesting. It tells that cool story, but also it's kind of in this nice little bed of other minerals, and from a, an aesthetic perspective, I think it's just super cute. Wow, there's just so much to choose from, but I think that I'm gonna have to go with this geode here because the amethyst is very beautiful, but just how geodes can be and having the random surprises in there is just really nice. And I'd like you to take a look at these. So we covered so many types of amethyst on this episode today. So many cool different mineral specimens, geode, faceted gems, and I think it's just a great example of the variety that you can get with just one gemstone. Just one. If you want to see more gemologist versus geologist episodes, let us know in the comments the next one that you want us to cover. And don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring that bell so you don't miss out on any of our future videos. See you next time.